If you've been struggling with anxiety and depression and don't know where to turn for mental health support, HERS can help. At ForHers.com, you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medications 100% online if they're right for you. To get started, go to ForHers.com slash Elise. That's ForHers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Craving more content from Lemonada Media? Subscribe to Lemonada Premium today and unlock access to exciting bonus content not only from us but from all the shows across the network. You'll hear exclusive audio that continues to highlight all the ways we can make life suck less. You'd also be helping Lemonada bring you more of your favorite content for just $4.99 a month. Check out a free trial of Lemonada Premium today in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then the subscribe button. Lemonada. Okay, actually, can you just pretend that you're listening to a fully complete theme song here? I got really in my head, and I tried to make it perfect, and I couldn't. So this is going to be the theme song right here. (laughs) Hello, this is Funny Because It's True, and I'm Elise Myers. You know what I'm realizing? Every episode of this podcast is kind of like a stepping stone on some path. I don't really know where it's going, but it feels like with every guest that comes on this show and shares so much of themselves and their process, I get to learn more about myself and what I want and I don't want. This week, I talked to Aparna Nancherla. You probably know her from the Netflix special Stand Ups or maybe from her comedy album Just Putting It Out There. Lesser known facts, she was a staff writer on Late Night with Seth Meyers. In this conversation with Aparna, we talk about distinguishing our role in comedy from our role in advocating for mental health. We also talk about feeling like you can't do something and then immediately after feeling like you can do literally anything and then how to take care of yourself when you actually need a break. So two things that are funny because they're true. Number one, I cried at Aparna for no reason, which you'll hear. And number two, it's possible that we will open up a coffee shop where it's a requirement to space out the tables far enough so that I cannot read everything that you are Googling. That will also make more sense later. Okay, let's get into it. Oh my gosh, Aparna, hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, I was going to say, I was just looking at your Twitter and I don't want to get it wrong. So your handle is a par napkin. Yes. And your bio was, I'm a scrunched up napkin <laughs> with recyclable dreams. <laughs> yeah. And I want to understand it. Can you please walk me through what that means? I wish I could give you like a really thought out, a meditated exploration of that. But I really, I mean, I joined Twitter very early on. I don't know when it actually launched as a platform, but I think I joined like 2008 or like, yeah, pretty early. Wow. And, you know, people are like, just have fun with it. And it was <laughs> that thing before it was for networking. So I didn't use like my real name. I feel like now yeah. it's just people's professional handles. And then I was like, okay, I'm a napkin. What, what do I want to say about myself <laughs> if I'm talking from a napkin's point of view? I really didn't think it out. I was just like, this is going to be it. And then I just never changed it. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. Um, Okay. Shifting topics a little bit. So really quick, I know that you are writing a book and you are writing it about um, imposter syndrome, right? Yes. Yes. What made you want to start that and why? Yeah. So, you know, I had toyed with the idea of writing a book before, but I really didn't know other than maybe that it would personal essays, what they would be about. But imposter syndrome felt like just something that's shown up in pretty much every aspect of my life. So it felt like something that would be maybe a way to make the book cohesive. But I, I think when I imagined writing it, I was like, I'm going to write about imposter syndrome and then I'm going to face it and then I'm going to fix it. And then I'll have this book and I won't be an imposter anymore. (laughs) You'll be a, yeah, like the imposter syndrome person, you know, you're healed, you've got it. What was it like writing it? I would say we, my imposter syndrome and I have reached a different stage in our relationship, Okay, but we're still going strong. (laughs) I love that for you. (laughs) 
Aparna is just out here testing what all of us would hope to happen when writing a book about imposter syndrome is that you start writing it and then at the last page you're like, you know what, I think I've healed from this. My fears are confirmed. Um, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I'm both very encouraged that I am in good company with Aparna and also deeply saddened that it doesn't happen the way I would hope. <laughs> I have ventured into the realm of writing books, and every time I do, I, I feel very um, intimidated by it. And I was curious, like, what the creative process was like approaching that compared to maybe being on a set. I also, because I've never written a book before, didn't really know what the process should look like. And I think I have kind of romanticized it of like, <laughs> oh, I'll go to a cabin and I'll just write yeah. for eight hours a day. But my, like, go to a coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> First of all, I never get anything done in a coffee shop. Like no. I just stare at everyone else who seems like they're just getting it done. The tables are always so close. I'm like, I can so smell your coffee yes. at my table. Yeah. Like I shouldn't be able to feel the steam from your latte on my face. Yeah. It's like, it's too close. <laughs> I know. And suddenly everything everyone else is doing is just so interesting, like interesting, but also distracting in a way where I'm like, this is not even fair that I'm judging you for like turning a page of your book like that is not even a loud thing and I'm like god you're so <laughs> annoying <laughs> oh my gosh well going back to maybe your book a little bit talking about the imposter syndrome like I guess was there something in your comedy career that sparked that or was that something post comedy career that you kind of started experiencing I think a combination of both like I think I've had it since I started comedy and even like I said in other parts of my life just like relationships or even friendships sometimes where I'm just like, I don't feel like I know how to like truly show up for people the way other people do. And I think definitely in comedy, like, especially when you're starting out and you're struggling, you're like, when I get this thing X or like when I can support myself doing this, I will like can relax a little bit. Yeah. But then it feels like when you get success and everyone says this, but like your problems change, but it, it also kind of makes you doubt yourself in a way that I didn't expect where like the expectations go up and you don't feel necessarily like you even have license to complain about them because you feel lucky sure. to be there. Yeah. Do you have an example of when you like vividly remember that happening to you? I mean, even just like career opportunities, like when I, you know, like got a chance to tape a half hour Netflix special. Like I remember when I got the offer, I was really like, I don't, I don't even know if I have enough material. And then, you know, my reps were kind of like, well, it doesn't really seem like something you should turn down. And I think I actually did turn it down the first time because I really just didn't feel ready. And I was kind of like, am I closing a door that I'm not going to get? A chance at again. But I really like was like, I really think it's more important for me to feel like I have the right thing to show rather yeah. than just showing it because I didn't want to like, turn it down. Was this the stand-ups, the one on Netflix, yeah. the mm -hmm. that one? Yeah, that was my introduction to you and your comedy. Oh. And I was like, I felt more than anybody in that special because it's for anybody listening, it's like multiple comedians, like, back to back, right? Yeah. I think it's six maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And um, your special specifically, I was like, man, our personalities and our senses of humor are so similar that I found myself watching your special like multiple times oh. because like <laughs> it felt so easy. Just the way you deliver your jokes is so natural. It's like just breathing and it doesn't sound like a joke. It just sounds like you're talking and you're funny. And like, that was what drew me to your comedy. And I'm curious if you have always felt that way, like, or is this something that you wanted your whole life? I think it's not something I knew I wanted early on. Cause I don't even think I knew I was funny until probably like just late, like maybe high school. I think I knew I liked to be silly and like laugh and make people laugh but just in a sort of like people I knew well and like friends yeah. and family and still like never really being comfortable being the center of attention. But I didn't grow up watching SNL or anything. So I like didn't oh, wow. feel well versed in like the comedic form or like the history of comedy or like how you even get into doing stand up. Like I didn't think that was something anyone could try. I did read though that your first stand up show was at a truck stop open mic. How did you get comfortable going on stage for the first time? Like the only other thing I can explain, I don't want to 
not give myself any credit, but I had like shortly before gone on antidepressants for the first time. And I do feel like there's a honeymoon period when you first go on antidepressants where you're just like, I didn't know I could experience life at this level yeah. of feeling. Um, cause I had been like struggling with depression up until that point, like pretty seriously at that point in my life. And I think it was that sort of like, oh my gosh, like maybe this is the beginning of the rest of my life. So like, I'll try anything. Like, I think I just, I think my comedy has always been like kind of trying to connect with other people. Cause I feel like I have so much trouble doing that sometimes in just day to day life. Like it felt like a language between me and other people that I can't access in other ways that other people seem to. Totally. I that I mean, that's how I feel about comedy as well, is it is like a point of connection. Yeah. What did you go to school for? I went to undergrad for psychology, psych major. Oh, wow. Did you want to go into that psych major because of your struggle with mental health and you wanted to kind of connect the two? Not really. Like, it, I just went with psychology because I think it was the only field I found where that I was like consistently interested in what I was learning. Like I didn't really feel connected to other subjects in the same way, but I just find human behavior so fascinating and like why we do the things we do that it really was that. It was like the only subject that kind of kept my interest because it's something you can kind of directly tie to your own life yeah. where it's not like history and you're like, what does this have to do with me? Like, yeah, like, what does this yeah, mean for me? Yeah. I feel like that lends itself very well to comedy. Yeah. How have you found that to be useful in, in your comedy career, I guess? So you know, stand up can be so observational. And I feel like yeah. I'm as a quieter person, constantly just like observing how other people behave in situations. And I think in a way, it was kind of adaptive at first to be like, what are they doing? What, like, should yeah. I be doing that? And yeah, psychology kind of gives you more of the like, why behind why people behave certain ways in certain situations. So it felt like in a way it was like getting cheat codes. Yeah, a cheat code that cost you a lot of time and money and hard work, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> a very time consuming and money yeah. draining cheat code. Other would call that just like experience, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> You know, you just said that comedy is a lot of like perceiving what's going on around you and like watching people. Like, is that kind of how you create sets? Is that your inspiration for writing jokes is just sitting and watching? Yeah, I mean, I think my my comedy comes from a very specific place of like how I'm perceiving the world around me. And a lot of that is I think I'm just fascinated with the day to day behavior of all of us because it feels like it's easier to zoom in on the like highs and the lows, but then if yeah. it, kind of the in-between is what fascinates me the most. It's very interesting it, that you said that because I, I totally connect with that as well. Yeah. And even with like the mental health stuff of like anxiety and depression, which I've dealt with like for forever pretty much, like I think it it feels like even as a culture, as much progress as we've made towards talking about these things, it does feel like it focuses on like the crisis moments or the lowest lows. Totally. And I feel like more of it is just managing it on a day-to-day -day basis and like, how am I just going to get through this next phone call or whatever it is? Yep. And so I'm like, I want more people to talk about like how they just got from morning to night. Yeah. I know that you've been vocal about it, like mental health and stuff in your comedy and the interviews and all of that. And only because I'm speaking from experience here where like you mentioned it a few times and it kind of can become your entire like platform oh, or sure. um, things, how people, they see you as this advocate now for mental health. And while I feel very fortunate that I can speak yes. about it and make it normal, how do you balance that of like, I still want to be funny. And yeah. it's like, I can't really be funny if like all you want to hear about is my depression. You know right, what I mean? Like, right, right. How, what is that balance for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Because I feel like I when I first started talking about that in my act, it was, I did kind of, people were like, wow, she's talking about mental health and she's yeah. trying to be funny about it. And I was like, well, I'm not the first person to do this. You know, like <laughs> yeah. I looked up to Maria Bamford for however long, and I know plenty of other comedians who have talked about it in their act. And I, I don't know if it's because I'm a woman of color that it was suddenly like a new angle or something, but yeah. it is, it is funny how people want to make they want to be like, okay, so you're this kind of comedian, you know, like totally. this is your thing. Because even when I was like talking about it, it still was just like, you know, an eighth of my, like it wasn't all I talked about by any means. Right. So 
it, it it's funny that people kind of latch onto that one thing and you have to kind of be like, well, actually that's just like one other detail about how my brain works. About my life. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I always, whenever anyone asks me about it, I always try and say like, I don't want to become the face of this. Yeah. Because um, number one, like I'm trying to just incorporate it so naturally into what I do that yeah. it feels normal. I, I want it to be, and I say this a lot, is like I want it to feel as normal as talking about like the weather. Right. I can imagine that can be hard in stand up specifically. Yeah. And it feels like when I first started talking about it, like sometimes the audience would immediately be on board. Sometimes they would be a little bit like, not sure how to feel, like maybe like yeah. feel sorry for me a little bit. But now it does seem like culturally it's become to some extent more normalized. So when I talk about it, everyone's like, yeah, of course, we all have anxiety. Like, yeah. Uh, it's what, 2023. Yeah. We all have panic attacks <laughs> yeah, in our yeah, cars yeah, after yeah. lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a good thing in some ways, but it's also just like so interesting to have noticed that shift. Okay, we got to take a quick break. And when we return, Aparna tells us about getting into acting. We all know that mental health can be messy, and it can be hard sometimes to even get a grasp on how you're feeling. Am I anxious? Am I hungry? Do I need therapy or just a cheeseburger? Everyone's on their own unique journey, and if there is one thing I know, it's that mental health isn't linear. How you feel can change on a weekly, daily, and sometimes even hourly basis, but it's the most important thing to take care of. That's why I'm excited to partner with Calm, the number one mental wellness app to give you the tools that improve the way that you feel. If you go to calm.com slash Elise, you'll get a special offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription and new content is added every week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to sleep better and take care of their minds. Thank you, Calm. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash Elise. Go to C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash Elise for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash Elise. There's so much coping that we're all expected to do on our own, but it doesn't have to be that way. Sure, we can share mental health tips and strategies like my treadmill desk or my dinner routine, but sometimes that's just not enough. HERS offers access to mental health care that can support you in your day-to-day, including dealing with anxiety and depression. At ForHERS.com, you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medications 100% online, if they're right for you. If prescribed, get your first month of treatment for only $25, afterwards it's $85 a month, or $49 with a three-month subscription. To get started, go to forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Hers makes it so simple. For example, there's no insurance required. It doesn't really get much simpler than that. Get started today at forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Offer only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Subscription required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. So, okay, so going back just a little bit, um, I know that you released a comedy album with Tig Notaro before your Netflix special. What was that like? Because Tig is a huge comedy inspiration for me. Oh my gosh, yeah, I I know. She's, well, yeah, she's like an incredible comedian, but then she's also just like a lovely, wonderful person, which you're like, oh, I guess you can just be every all the things. I love that. Um, <laughs> but I think I had gotten the chance to open for her at like oh, uh, wow. maybe the New York Comedy Festival or so- something when she was in town. And then um, I had worked with her a few times after that. And she like reached out to me like, have you ever thought about doing an album? I'm launching this like label and I'm just reaching out to comics I love who, who might want to record something. And that felt like the, kind of the same thing as a Netflix thing where I was like, well, I yeah. never thought about it before, but like you believe in me. So like, it feels wow. weird to say no. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, it it's strange with imposter syndrome, how sometimes you're like, you need overt like contradiction to be like, okay, maybe you're not always right. Yeah. I, I experienced the same thing. And I joke about it with my husband all the time. Like, 
things can be so good that I avoid it. I will yes. not open that email. I will not read that text. I won't listen to that voicemail because it's so good. It makes me physically sick. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Do you experience that? Well, oh my gosh. I relate to that so much. Like, I think I actually have a harder time with good news or like sitting oh, yeah. in something good that happened to me or something nice someone said to me. That is so much more uncomfortable to me than fa- like, I'm like, I wear failure like a little tailored suit. <laughs> yeah, I I am much more comfortable, yeah, with failure than good things. Because, too, I feel like, um, and I don't know if you experienced this, but the good things that happen, I'm nervous they're not going to be as good as they seem. So I'm nervous mm. I'm going to be let down. Or I'm nervous that, like, I will be, I will get you, this sounds so depressing, no, but no. I will get so used to that good feeling and it's going to go away and then I'm going to go back to like sad. And then I'm like, oh, totally. well, I wish I would have never experienced that in the first place because now I have to go back to sad and I don't want to do that. I'd rather just stay sad. I know. So when you yeah. were saying that, I was just like, oh, great fears, great fears. Okay, wait. So I will not lie. When Aparna just kept saying, oh, great fears, great fears, I didn't really understand what she was saying and that she was like in support of what I was saying. And so it took like a couple minutes down in the conversation for me to fully understand that she was like, yeah, totally. Like retweet, Elise. Like definitely. Yes, I agree with you. And I wish I could have like rewinded back in our conversation to respond to that better and been like, yes, thank you. (laughs) But instead, I just kind of stayed quiet because I was like, I don't know what you're saying. (laughs) What? <laughs> really? You're saying the correct things to worry about. <laughs> um, no, I feel the same way. Like I'm either constantly waiting for a shoe to drop. Like I was telling someone when I get good news, I think my window of like actually appreciating it is maybe like two minutes before a couple it seconds, just yeah. turns into worry, 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 worry. Because even for like acting, like I think before I acted at all, I was just like, yeah, anything, like I'll do whatever job. And now it's like, I'll I'll get a job and then I'll be so excited, but then I will get stressed out about like a wardrobe fitting. I have literally said no to jobs because they required a wardrobe fitting. <laughs> and just like how to talk to the wardrobe person, like while we're changing clothes, like do I oh, talk to them in between? <laughs> do I not? I don't know. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You said acting. Are you, um, I know that you took a break from tours, right? And you went more into mm. like acting and voice acting and stuff like that. Yeah. Was that a conscious like pivot that you made? It was somewhat to the extent that I think I just figured out for me that touring was just like taxing for me in a way that I was like, I don't think this can be my only thing. Like yeah. just all the travel and being alone so much um, and not in your own space. Like I think I found that uh pretty draining like in a non-sustainable yeah. way so I was like I can do this from time to time but I can't be someone who's like on the road most of the yeah. year um so it's like what what are my other options man and so then did acting feel like it fulfilled that like creative and comedy kind of void in your life or did it was it something completely different I think it's all, that's the thing with entertainment. It's like, everything is so different. And then people are sort of like, yeah, but you can do that too, right? And I'm like, well, it is completely different muscle and like completely different. Like how hard could it be? But also no. Yeah. It's like a skill that people spend their whole lives working on. But yeah, sure, I can do it. Um, Figure it out. Yeah. But I think I'm very lucky. And I think sometimes is a nice thing about comedy is like, if you kind of hone a specific voice, then like, And people recognize that eventually. So they're not like expecting me to come and, you know, turn myself into the queen like a Kate Blanchett or something. They're like, okay, we're going to get some version of an Aparna for this character. Do you find that that's the easiest to do is like just versions of yourself and not completely like different characters from your personality? I think there's some, like I just did this movie that came out on Hulu called The Drop. And I think I probably played a character that's the most unlike myself that I've ever played. She's like a lesbian who's a recent mom and she's just gotten super protective of her kid to the point that she's kind of gone somewhat right wing and like pro gun. So I think that felt that felt like more of a leap for me and just like to inhabit that kind of mentality of like what would make someone shift their worldview because she like starts out very liberal before she has a kid and then she sort of does a 180. And I yeah, I think it is fascinating to play further away from myself, but then be like, how can I tie myself to this character? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's the fun, I think the more fun part of acting when you do get to play something that seems unlike you. 
at a glance. I guess for this specific character, like, how did you do that? What were the characteristics in her that you were like, okay, I see myself in this? Well, I think I have always had a lot of trouble expressing my anger and like holding it in in real time versus just completely internally and like pushing it inwards. So I think it was, it almost felt like, oh my gosh, this character is like permission to like let out a lot of aggression that I normally don't. And and I get paid for it. Like it felt, yeah, yeah in a way. I was Therapeutic. Like, take, yeah, take advantage <laughs> of this, of like, take all the anger that you've been sitting on for years and just put in, put in her. Did it make you want to play characters that were unlike yourself more often so you could experience parts of yourself that you don't get to tap into usually? Yeah, I think so. I think I often... I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like sometimes if you're a very socially anxious person or just someone who lives very internally, like loudly internally, you you constantly feel like you're performing a little bit in different mm-hmm. spaces. Maybe everyone feels this way, but in acting, it sort of just feels like a more overt version of that. But I think I do feel like I'm sort of performing all the time in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I relate to that more than I wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's funny is I literally just had this conversation with my husband and I was like, everybody does it. Like (laughs) everybody is performing on a daily basis, right? And he's like, no. (laughs) Like like the most sincere and loving no, but like that's a you thing. And I hope one day it isn't because like I have found that to be to really um, make me believe that I could pretty much do anything I wanted to in a, Mm. in a good and bad way. Like I call it the, um, how hard could it be gene where because of that idea of like, there is just a part of me that I am never fully off because I feel uncomfortable. I think with myself and if I'm completely unmasked, just myself. Right. And so because of that, I'm like, I could act, I could write a screenplay. Like, yeah, I, I, I fully believe I could do anything. And I'm, I'm curious if there's anything in your life, especially in the creative world, is there anything that you haven't explored or want to that you feel like, you know, I've never done it, but I could probably figure it out and it sounds interesting? Yeah, I mean, I would still love to write like a screenplay or something. And, yeah. I, and I know that's like not an original thing to say for someone in entertainment, <laughs> but I think for me it is, and I think this is actually part of imposter syndrome of like, knowing on some level that you're like, I am capable of this, but then going so much to the other end, like just kind of toggling back and forth all the time between like, I don't know how to do anything. I'm like the worst. And then the imposter syndrome is the taking you down a notch and being like, but could you? (laughs) That's like the fear of not living up to something. Like the idea of me being able to write a screenplay feels great because until I actually do it, it's like the Schrodinger's screenplay. Right, like right, it totally. exists and doesn't exist. So yeah. I'll never know. Right. But if you try, then you feel that, that weight of like, well, if I fail, that sucks. And I don't want to believe that about myself. Yeah. And so it's comfortable. Actually, I remember reading something about this where it's like, that's sort of the problem with perfectionism is like, you have this ideal that you're like, I can make, you know, the best screenplay. But then when you actually start doing it, it's like nowhere like the ideal that you've envisioned. So you're just like, well, I'm not going to do that. This feels horrible compared to the thing I'm imagining. Yeah, I think it's that the actual doing is a lot less romantic than the idea of doing. Yeah. 50% of my doing is quitting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like half of it is deciding, you know what? This sucks. I'm the worst and I'm never going to do this again. And then the next day, like having a good nap and snack and being like, well, maybe if I'm going to throw it away anyways, I might as well try it one more time because it's already going in the trash. Totally. It is funny that on some level we are all just like big babies. Toddlers. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And it's just like, oh, I didn't drink enough water. And that's why I'm having an existential crisis. Totally. Yeah. Every time I like parent my son, I'm always like, I could learn a lot from you. (laughs) (laughs) We're a lot more alike than uh, I think we are. All right, time for one more break. And when we come back, we hear what it was like for Aparna to come back to comedy after taking a pause. Hydration. It's everything. We all could be drinking more water and we all could be drinking better water, like filtered water. 
LifeStraw Home is a kitchen upgrade that you'll wish you had made years ago. It's gone viral on TikTok twice. They even made a hand-blown glass version. These pictures are beautiful to look at, so I can understand why people love them so much. And they are so, so useful. Having a pitcher ready in my fridge reminds me and motivates me to keep myself hydrated, which is the best part. It's the only pitcher that removes microplastics, bacteria, and more than 30 other common contaminants from tap water. Not to mention, it makes your water taste way better. Most importantly, LifeStraw fights for the planet and gives back. For every pitcher sold, a child in need receives a year of safe water. Water for everybody. Better filtration, better taste, better design. Use code Elise, that's E-L-Y-S-E, for 15% off the purchase of any LifeStraw home product at LifeStraw.com. LifeStraw.com, code E-L-Y-S-E. Have you ever tried putting together furniture for yourself? It can be a humbling experience. What if I told you that you could have gorgeous furniture without the clunky assembly process? Introducing The Bed by Thuma. Handcrafted from eco-friendly, high-quality, upcycled wood, the bed has a modern, minimalist design that helps elevate any space. The bed is put together using the timeless technique of Japanese joinery. Each piece locks into place, meaning no tools or excess hardware are required for assembly. With clean lines, subtle curves, and lifestyle-enhancing details, the bed is simple sophistication for the bedroom. Made for how you live, The Bed by Thuma is backed with a lifetime warranty, ships right to your door in three easy-to-maneuver boxes, and takes about five-ish minutes to assemble with no tools required. Make your bedroom more sleek with The Bed by Thuma. And now go to thuma.co slash funny to receive a $25 credit towards your purchase of The Bed plus free shipping in the continental U.S. Go to thuma.co slash funny. That's T-H-U-M-A dot C-O slash funny for a $25 credit. I think too, as creative people, we, um, the idea of like output is so important, right? Just like any job, like you're only as good as kind of what you can output. Yes. But the hard part about that is creativity relies so much on like rest and being inspired and, um, having the space to really work it out by yourself before anyone has any eyeballs and hands on it. Yeah. I'm curious if, um, with acting or maybe back in your uh, touring and, and doing stand up, like if you ever felt like there was a point where you were like, this is a grind and I just can't do it, like, or I feel burnt out, like, how did you manage that? And if you did experience that, like, how did you kind of recover from that feeling? Yeah. I mean, when I started writing the book, I think, I think it actually sunk me pretty low mentally because I think I was mm. kind of confronting a lot of just negative beliefs that really felt so real and like what I had Mm -hmm. built my entire identity around. And so I was just like struggling a lot with writing the book and then doing stand up at the same time felt almost like excruciating because it was like Mm -hmm. already feeling so bad about myself and then kind of putting myself in front of strangers for like further evaluation uh, at the same time. Oh God, I feel this so deeply. The 1% of assholes that are just like, are dedicated to disliking you and misunderstanding you really ruin it for you. And I hate that because there's like 99% of people that love you and just support the shit out of you. (laughs) The 1% is like, no, I'm going to be louder than all of them. Oh, God. So I I took a very long break from stand-up, like pretty much the entire time I wrote the book. And it happened to fall during the pandemic. So like weirdly was okay because a lot of performing was not happening as much. But Yeah, I took almost like I think a two and a half year break and I've only recently in the past few months gotten back into stand up and I really didn't put pressure on myself. I wasn't like, okay, and now it's time to get back out there. Like I was like, try it, see how it makes you feel. If you still really can't handle it, like you don't have to do it. And I think that really helped. Like if I feel like in coming back to performing after such a long break, which felt like illegal at the time. I was like, if you stop yeah. for a couple months, like people forget about you. And so yeah. I really was just like, well, this is probably it for me. Like I, I think it just coming back after so long made it so new again. And kind of like I could reset the terms and honestly is probably the best thing I've done career wise is just stepping away from it, which I think is yeah. not anything I would have allowed for before taking a break. 
I think that is really powerful for me to hear because I think that like there is so much fear in um I don't know why I was making emotional. No, <laughs> I, I think there's yeah. like so much there's so much fear in um in uh, like becoming irrelevant. And so I think that if you feel like like you're tired and you want to just you feel like you have to keep pushing through it. Like if I do have just a nap and a snack, like I can do it, but like you can't be funny and you can't, it can't fill your soul back up if you're exhausted. So totally. like, I think that taking that break for you to be able to step back and be like, there's no amount of like rest that's going to fix this. I just, I need to step away and to reevaluate, try something new. And if I want to come back, like not enough people do that. They yeah. they push through it. And that's really what makes you never come back because it will burn you out so fast. And so it's, I'm really proud of you for stepping away and making it this new thing because now you get to come back and it is fresh and people don't forget who you are because that's not the way it works. And yeah. I think a lot of that fear comes from within us and we make up a lot of things in our head, you know? Totally. And I think it's also just you relearning like what your life is without this thing that has like come to define who you are. And I think for a lot of standups, they are like, that is who I am, even ahead of being a person. Like it's getting on stage, getting in front of people, making them laugh. And I was like, I need to realize I am a full person without this thing, like yeah. whether or not I do this thing. And I think that's really hard. Like it was really hard for me. And I understand why people like can't face that sometimes. <laughs> This is just like a verbal underlining of everything that Aparna just said. Great fears. Great fears. So what is it like now coming back after your break and, and reapproaching this stand-up career? And like, what is this like this time compared to last? I mean, I think the expectations are less. And again, I feel lucky in that I have like career avenues that I can work on right. that aren't stand-up. And if I if I was committed to stand-up, it might be a different story if that was my sole source of income, but I do feel like I can kind of do it on my own terms now where, where I can do it, but then I'm not like, if I'm not getting on stage X times a week, I'm like not yeah growing fast enough or I'm not building enough material. Um, like I've done a series of workout shows recently just to kind of build up more material and everyone's like, oh, are you taping a special? Are you, I'm like, no, I'm just, I just wanted to see if I could do it. I imagined yeah. literally working out when you yeah, said that. I and I was like, what? And then it took me a second. Okay. I know. I know. Someone else was like, so you like exercise in front of people? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> You're like, it's of. a dual comedy special. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm yeah. teaching. It's like a jazzercise yeah, plus yeah. like comedy. Break the form. <laughs> I love that. I love that you have the, the padding in your life professionally to not rely on this as your main thing so you can enjoy it again. I think that everybody has to fall in love, out of love, and then back in love with with the creative process and their creative outlet, you know, and, and comedy and all of that. Yeah. And I think with art, especially, or like anything creative, like once there's like money tied to it, you, the, oh, yeah. re your relationship to it inevitably changes. So it's just like important to kind of make sure you're like reevaluating, you know, what what's there, why you're there, why you're totally. like creating what you are. Um, and I think I, yeah, I really just needed to take stock of that. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see all the stuff, oh. the book and all of it. Like you're doing so much and I'm so happy for you. It's oh. awesome. Oh, likewise. <laughs> it's so nice to know there's like-minded people out there. We're doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Aparna Nancherla. If you like the show, give a review and a rating, maybe. It just helps people find us. Okay. See you next week. Bye. There's always more funny because it's true with Lemonada Premium. You'll get access to all of Lemonada's premium content, including My Five Questions with Brian Baumgartner, which aired last Friday. Subscribe now in Apple Podcasts. Funny Cause It's True is a Lemonada Media and Powder Keg production. The show is produced by Claire Jones, Zoe Dennis, and Linnea Tony. Our associate producer is Tiffany Bowie. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paul Feig, Laura Fisher, Kessla Childers, and me, Elise Myers. This show is mixed by Johnny Vince Evans, additional help from Noah Smith and Ivan Kraev. 
Our theme song music was written by me and scored by Xander Singh. Follow Funny Cause It's True wherever you get your podcasts or listen ad-free on Amazon Music with your Prime membership. Hey, Lemonada listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is that they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By just answering a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip and also keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com slash survey. Last Day from Lemonada Media explores the moments that change us. Those times where you look back and say, whoa, one day I was myself and the next I wasn't. I'm Stephanie Whittleswax, and I have seen time and time again how sharing these stories can change lives. So, do you have a moment in your life that changed you, fundamentally and forever? What happened? How did you move through it? And how did you eventually start again? If you'd like to share your story, go to bit.ly slash lastdaystories, B-I-T dot L-Y slash lastdaystories. We can't wait to hear from you. 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 We can't wait to hear from you.